why do you refuse to condemn Hamas when in fact, you know, it's actually so easy to do that and there are there are repercussions for not playing that game. I'm not passing judgment on Hamas because Hamas, for better or for worse, ended up being the only resistance organization that expressed this duty, not right, but duty of the people of Gaza, of the people of Palestine generally, to bring down the wall. I want to ask you about um, the European left intelligentsia. Give me Donald Trump anytime. Give me a fascist. <laughs> Seriously. You know, I want to see the enemy uh, look, who stares at me and says, you know, you shouldn't have the right to exist. I'm going to wipe you out. Uh, th 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 that, you know, I can handle that. I cannot handle comrades who are um, out of spinelessness. They, they crave the appreciation of the people who are complicit in the genocide of Palestinians. And that is worse for me. Is a worse failure, moral failure, than being a Zionist. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. As the genocide in Gaza accelerates, it's clear that the depths of Israeli and U.S. depravity know no bounds. No matter what Israel does, whether intentionally killing aid workers or summarily executing doctors at hospitals in Gaza, the media covers it up with parroted claims about a Hamas presence while U.S. spokespeople harp on the tired talking point about the need to protect Israel's security above all else. And the Europeans either applaud their U.S. masters or shrug as if totally powerless to stop their settler vassal state. Joining me to discuss this and more is Yanis Varoufakis, economist, political leader, former Greek finance minister, and the author of many books, including his latest, Techno-Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism? He's also co-founder of the international grassroots movement, DM25, and a professor of economics at the University of Athens. But before we jump into it, this is just part of this episode. The full interview is available to Breakthrough News members only. You can become a member at patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. And as always, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate this show, you can also donate below on YouTube. Yanis Varoufakis, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you on. I really appreciate you making the time. And I, you know, I think I just want to jump right into uh, uh, what I think is a good place to start. And that is what recently took place um, with the destruction of Shifa Hospital in Gaza and the killing of those seven aid workers with the World Central Kitchen in Gaza by the Israelis. We're going to talk about some other tangentially related things, but just, you know, very briefly, what are your thoughts on these latest atrocities? Because it does feel like every day you think it can't get worse and Israel does something worse. Indeed. Uh, the the, the greatest worry I have with every such atrocity, beyond the fact that I can't sleep at night, at the thought that all these crimes against humanity are being perpetrated in my name, uh, in the name of um, citizens of Europe, in the name of the West, to which, for better or for worse, I supposedly belong. Uh, my greatest worry is the process of desensitizing public opinion uh, because with the escalation of the death toll of the kill rate by the IDF, uh, it's really very hard to keep up the pace of one's outrage uh, in conjunction, uh, pro rata, with the actual outrage. Uh, so it's so very easy for people to say, oh, well, so how many people were killed today in, in what hospital? Only 50. Oh, okay. Well, Yesterday, 60 were killed. So this process of desensitizing public opinion, uh, I have no doubt that it's, um, it's an intricate part of the strategy of um, the Israeli warmongers, of the ones who are actually planning those atrocities. These atrocities are not accidents. They are not uh, the result of some rogue Israeli colonel um, making decisions on the ground. This is a strategy. And, uh, in conjunction with the toxic hypocrisy coming from Washington, from Berlin, from London, from Athens, uh, 
Uh, it, 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 I, I suffocate. I, I personally feel I'm suffocating. And that's a really good way to put it. And I like the idea, the word toxic hypocrisy. Um, <clears throat> it really is just completely stunning. And, you know, Yanis, one thing that I want to, to ask you about specifically is, you know, after just a few days, I think after October 7th, you did something I really appreciated. And that is in an interview, you refused to play the game of condemning Hamas and you have continued to refuse to play that game. Um, you even said, and I'm quoting you, the criminals here are not Hamas, the criminals are Europeans. And the reason that I appreciated this uh, so much is because across the political spectrum in the global north, right after October 7th, uh, everybody was full of condemnation for Hamas, condemnation for October 7th. You know, even in some cases, if they have expressed sympathy for, uh, with Palestinians. So I'm curious, you know, nearly six months into this, why do you refuse to condemn Hamas when, in fact, you know, it's actually so easy to do that? And there are there are repercussions for not playing that game. Because I've been to Gaza. I've been to Ramallah. I have seen the infrastructure of apartheid. I've seen the long queues of Palestinians being ritually humiliated. I have seen the, uh, the, the open prison camp, concentration camp that is Gaza. And therefore I know in my bones that any people who have been placed uh, under such conditions for such a very long time have a duty to themselves to bring down the wall, <laughs> to quote <laughs> Roger Waters and Pink Floyd, you know, to bring down the bloody wall. Uh, in war, as part of the Geneva Convention, it's a recogni recognized duty of prisoners of war to escape. What about two million people who have been encased behind barbed wire, whose children were malnourished before the 7th of October? 60% of kids, according to the United Nations, were malnourished before the, the 7th of October, who have no right to travel have no right to dream. They, their airport was tore up by the Israeli army. There is no port. Uh, it, Netanyahu himself, himself made the point that we will keep them hungry, but not to the level of famine. He was saying that for years before the 7th of October. Uh, the people who find themselves in that situation would not be human if they didn't try to bring down that wall. Now, I'm not passing judgment on Hamas because Hamas, for better or for worse, ended up being the only resistance organization that expressed this duty, not right, but duty of the people of Gaza, of the people of Palestine generally, to bring down the wall. Do I agree with Hamas? It doesn't matter. It is irrelevant. Because you see, the, you know, the, there is this truth reversal here. Uh, allow me to share with you a shocking conversation I had last Thursday with a German, uh, quite well-known politician. I, I'm not at liberty to, to mention his name because it was private conversation. But he's somebody high up in the SPD, the Social Democratic Party in the German government, uh, who had the audacity. Uh, he went beyond accusing me of being a Hamas sympathizer. He, he, he effectively... Um, referred to me as somebody who was uh, sympathizing with the Nazis. I said, wow. that, that's a social democrat in the German government. And his argument was this. He said, look, he said, I'm German. Now, why are you, as a Greek, kicking and screaming about tens of thousands of Palestinian children being killed? And at that point, my, boil, my blood started boiling. And he said, I'm German. I condone the fact that hundreds of thousands of children in Germany were killed by the Allies in the context of defeating Hitler. So you see what happens here. Here's a German condoning the killing of tens of hundreds of thousands of German children, and uh, by that justifying the tens of thousands of Palestinian children who are being killed by making the association Nazis, Gaza, which is the most monstrous truth reversal in the history of the last 300 years. Because essentially, the victims who are the Palestinians of ethnic cleansing, 
of um, uh, a, a, racial, a racialized uh, terra nullius project of treating them as non-human before they were ethnically cleansed, beginning with the Nakba in 1948, the victims are being presented as the Nazis. So the condemnation of Hamas is part of this truth reversal, because when I said to him, you know, I was trying to keep my cool, right? <laughs> and I said to him at some point, you, you're part of a government that believes in the two-state solution. Yes? Yes. Well, you are aiding and abetting a prime minister, Mr. Netanyahu, and the whole cabal, everybody who is in that government, and, every, and you know, many guns who will replace him if somebody replaces him, uh, who do not believe in the two-state solution, whose raison d'etre, the whole point of their existence, they came to this world to kill the two-state solution. That's what they did. After the Palestinians, mistakenly as it turns out, went through the Oslo Accords, and you know the Palestinian Authority, uh, the PLO, rec Fata, recognized Israel. Israel never recognized Palestine. Palestine. They recognized the PLO. Uh, what did Ariel Sharon and then Benjamin Netanyahu set out to do? To kill off any chances of a two-state solution. And you're supporting it. Huh? And why, why is Hamas a topic of discussion? Because Netanyahu succeeded in killing off the two-state solution. Yeah. In 1992, uh, Hamas was irrelevant. So the direction of causality, the relation between cause and effect is Netanyahu and his cabal killed off the two-state solution, and that gave rise to Hamas. Mm -hmm. And here is the German government saying that because there is Hamas, there cannot be no two-state solution. So you see, you have... Truth reversal after truth, truth reversal. And who was the, the author, the guru of truth reversal? Joseph Goebbels. Mm. He was very proud of them. Yes. And his, uh, I guess his, uh, the people who are like him today are like Matt Miller and <laughs> these spokespeople at the State Department, watching them drives me crazy. But, you know, I think this goes into another point that I've often seen you make, Giannis, which is uh, it's about the timeline, this truth reversal you're talking about. It's also when began, like what began when, right? Um, it's not just that it didn't start on October 7th, but Israel's supporters are excellent at starting the timeline whenever it's most convenient to their narrative. And it's something the U.S. does very well, uh, uh, too. They have to... You know, they have to take land for their security to prevent another October 7th from happening, but they'll just pretend it wasn't, you know, all a result of the fact that they've been stealing this land since even before 1948. And then, you know, they do the same thing with Lebanon as well. They'll say, oh, like Hezbollah's in Lebanon. So the fact that it exists is why they have to bomb Lebanon, but they bombed Lebanon before Hezbollah existed. And that's actually why Hezbollah exists. Um, Indeed. <laughs> It's such a convenient narrative, and I, I, I'm, I guess I'm just adding to what you're saying, but I like the idea of calling it truth reversal. But another thing I'm curious if I can get your, your comment on here is it's always portrayed in this um, in this like discussion about Israel security, right? Israel security and American and Western interests. We're, you know, what I'm beginning to not beginning to understand, what I've always understood is that the Middle East is not safe. It's not secure with the existence of a settler colony here. Like that's the problem. And it just yeah. comes to the idea of like, how come the security of Palestinians and the people in this region don't matter? It's always about Israel's security. Well, that's the, 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 the result of the manner in which Israel was put together. Uh, and, you know, speaking of when did the whole thing begin? Well, it began with anti-Semitism in Europe. Uh, we Europeans carried out pogrom after pogrom against the Jews. It wasn't in Israel or Palestine. It wasn't just in Jerusalem. Um, the Jews living in Jerusalem next to Palestinians lived in perfect harmony compared to the life of Jews in Odessa, in uh, uh, Berlin, in, in Spain, from where the Catholics... Um, chucked them out, and they ended up where? Where did they have, besides Jerusalem, where did the Jews find some sanctuary? It was in Thessaloniki, Greece's second city, 
and in Constantinople, in Istanbul. Hello, hello, right? hello. In the Ottoman Empire. That's where the Jews had, uh, you know, the, the greatest amount of security. It was in Eastern Europe, in Britain, in Central Europe, in Southern Europe, in my country. Yeah. I, at some point, my grandmother, when I was, you know, 10, 11, 12, she was telling me the stories about how in her village they would burn the Jew, not an effigy of the Jew. But anti-Semitism was rampant throughout Europe. So that's where it had begun. Uh, and, you know, we went from pogrom to pogrom and then to the Holocaust. That had nothing right. to do with the Palestinians, with the Lebanese, with the Arabs. Absolutely zero to do with that. Huh? And then what started as the white supremacist ideology of the British Empire? Because remember, and that, 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 I was in Australia two or three weeks ago and uh, I had the opportunity of addressing the National Press Club with all the press in Canberra, in the capital of the, uh, the federal capital of, of Australia. I said to them, folks, remember how it all started here in Australia? When Captain Cook, representing the British Empire, came to Botany Bay and proclaimed Australia to be terra nullius, an, an empty land. Essentially, he looked at all the aborigines oh. and he said, these are not humans. It's an empty land. Uh, what, how did Zionism set foot in, uh, in, in Palestine under the slogan, the vile slogan, a land without a people for a people without a land. Now, wh where, did they, where did they get this from? They didn't conjure it up from thin air. It's the British Empire, Terra Nullius logic, which they, they practiced in Kenya. They practiced in th South Africa. Okay, the natives are not humans, therefore we can shoot them. Okay, remember in Australia, um, the natives acquired uh, um, civic rights in 1967, 1967. So there's a long tradition of white settler suprem supremacism. And Zionism simply copied that. And with the help of the British, the Balfour Declaration initially, and then of course the United States, they created a state which is the equivalent of white supremacism. And it's saying it's a land without the people and we will take your land, Nakba. So the moment you say that these are the people, that's the beginning of genocide. Terra Nullius is the commencement of genocide. And people who actually per, uh, commit genocide know that they're doing it. It's not an accident, like the bombs <laughs> that killed the humanitarian workers now in Gaza. They were intentional. And anybody who kills people and throws them off their land feels insecure. Because immediately he thinks, and it's usually he, if I have done this to them, their descendants will want to do it to me. So when they talk about Israeli security, they're talking about their insecurity from the fact that they understand that they have committed war crimes and they've committed ethnic cleansing. So it is impossible to have Israeli state security, Israel as a Jewish state, for it to be secure without completing the genocide of the Palestinians. So anybody who talks about the need to preserve the Israeli security talks about completing the genocide of the Palestinians. Let's be clear about that. And I wish they were clear about that because, you know, I recognize a villain who is honest. Yeah, you got to at least appreciate the honesty to some degree. I want to ask you about um, the European left intelligentsia. Um, has... Has the European left intelligentsia taken a good position, a bad position? I mean, we, I know that with Russia, NATO, Ukraine, uh, it hasn't been the greatest. Um, has that been the same with Gaza? And I'm sure it's di you know different across countries. So I don't want to you know put make a blanket statement about the entire European left. But what has been your perception of the position people have been taking on Gaza? As an indication of my view on this, let me tell you that. Uh... In, in a few weeks, uh, short weeks, in the beginning of June, we have the European Parliament election. And I will be a candidate amongst other members of my movement across Europe. Uh, I'm telling you now that if I get elected, I will refuse to belong to the European left grouping in mm -hmm. Brussels. They have disgraced themselves. Uh, my comrades, former comrades in Berlin, uh, Die Linke, the local left party. Uh, they have uh, a long tradition and I'm, I've been friends with them and comrades for as long as I remember. 
there is the Rosa Luxemburg Center in uh, the center of former East Berlin, which is a great foundation. They've done remarkable work over the decades. Uh, immediately after the 7th of October, they banned the Palestinian author from um, uh, addressing an audience on the basis that she's Palestinian. And that and this is not a good time to have a Palestinian in the Rosa, I mean, poor La, Rosa Luxemburg. She must be spinning at 5,000 revs in her grave that they should be doing this. Uh, and generally, you know, the, the, you mentioned that before. First, they condemn Hamas. Then they talk about the right, the, the importance of providing Israeli security. And then they say, but at the same time, Palestinians matter as well, uh, which is, um, you know, Give me Donald Trump anytime. Give me a fascist. <laughs> Seriously, you know, I want to see the enemy uh, to look, who stares at me and says, you know, you shouldn't have the right to exist. I'm going to wipe you out. Uh, th that, 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 you know, I can handle that. I cannot handle comrades who are um, out of spinelessness because they're not bad people. They're just, they're just too scared that, you know, the Spiegel, or Le Monde, or, um, you know, Süddeutsche Zeitung is going to write about them when they write about me. That I am a Jew-hating, uh, crazy, who's destroyed Greece and whatever, you know. They, they crave the appreciation of the people who are complicit in the genocide of Palestinians. And that is worse, for me, is a worse failure, moral failure, than being a Zionist. You know, if you want to be a Zionist, be a Zionist, and let's, then we can have an interesting conversation and a clash. But don't pretend to be on the side of the good and be a humanist lefty when you're doing that. And, but then, you know, allow me to express my very great disappointment over my own kind, the left. Uh, because there is the other side as well. There are leftists who tragically veer towards anti-Semitism to say, oh, what do you expect from the Jews? The moment I hear that, you know, my hair stands on end because that is racist, that's anti-Semite, that's Nazi. There's no such thing as the Jews. Any sentence beginning with the Jews are like that is fascist. Uh, it, you know, it's like saying the Palestinians are, there's so much difference of opinion amongst Palestinians. You can say the Palestinians have been uh, victims of genocide, but you can't say that the, the, the Palestinians think this way. Because I, you know, I, I have five Palestinian friends, they have 20 different opinions amongst themselves. Uh, so, and, and also on the, on, the, on the front of Ukraine, because I personally think that, that, that Vladimir Putin is a very vile character. I mean, I was with Jeremy Corbyn, my comrade in England. We demonstrated in 2001, 2001, when Vladimir Putin was the, the, the favorite son of the West in Moscow, Moscow, and they supported <laughs> yeah. him to the hilt. Uh, we were demonstrating over the murder of 250,000 Chechens in Grozny. Right, so no love lost for Vladimir Putin. My, I have friends who are in prison in Russia for not uh, for resisting Putin. So Putin is a is, is a criminal. I have no doubt about that. But at the same time, NATO have created him. He is a creation of the United States of America. They crushed the Russian people after 1991. They reduced life expectancy amongst men from 78 to 54 years of age. Uh, there's never been such a reduction in life expectancy in any country, even at war. And that was a policy of the United States uh, to completely squeeze, destroy financially the, the people of Russia and, and then to squeeze, to keep breaking their promises to, to, to Gorbachev, to Yeltsin and so on, keep pushing NATO towards Moscow until that the combination of the humiliation of the Russian people and the military, the NATO expansion created Putin. This is how, if, if you humiliate the people and, and, and you squeeze them, yeah, that's how Hitler was born. It was a result of the humiliation of the German people by the Allies after the First World War and their squeezing. So this is what they've done. So I would have liked the left to say neither Putin nor NATO, to say we want peace. And they, this war in Ukraine will have no winners except, you know, hundreds of thousands of dead people and lots of starving people in Africa and Asia because of the effect, the indirect effect of this war on fertilizer prices, on wheat prices, on corn prices and, and all that. And the left, what, what they do? The left has, in Europe, 
been divided. 90% of it is NATO is a, a liberation movement, which is absurd. And the other 10% are pro-Putin. And some of us are saying, who are saying neither, neither. Why do I have to take sides between two criminal organizations? Yeah. We are, we've been squeezed into a tiny, tiny minority of leftists. Yeah, I know it's really it's really unfortunate that that's the uh, parameters of the of the debate. I guess I would put it. Um, no I, I wanted to There's ask no you debate. in particular. There's not even a you, debate. Oh no, de not even a debate. Not even a debate. That's just the parameters of what exists. Um, it sounds actually uh, worse than the U.S. In the U.S., I think there's. Um, a bit more, maybe not in the mainstream media, but in general speaking on the left, there's much more nuance around the issue of NATO. But I, I think we're also separated from all of that by geography. Mm. So Russia can't be uh, portrayed as the same kind of, you know, monstrous threat the way it is uh, in the European context. Um, but I wanted to ask you specifically about Germany, because mm -hmm. uh, Germany <laughs> seems like its own its own monster. Um, I first I want to I want to show a clip that I'm sure you've seen, but just to remind you and the audience, I'm sure you saw this, Yanis. This is a German journalist asking a question to Francesca Albanese, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories, who recently wrote a report. Uh, laying out the case uh, that Israel is in fact carrying out a genocide in Gaza. And I, I want to show his question. And you're quoting uh, the president of Israel, the prime minister, the defense minister, and uh, some uh, top militaries. Um, but these are only quotes uh, given in speeches or in other circumstances. I would like to ask you, do you have a written document by the government which with a clear intent to commit genocide. Do you think that in Rwanda and in Bosnia-Herzegovina, any government officials wrote, wrote a document saying, I want to commit genocide? Have you seen anything like that? I'll, I'll answer this for you. No. It doesn't work like that. There is those. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there, but I do encourage people to go see the rest of that video. But I thought that was important to play just to kind of segue into Germany because what's wrong with that guy? Why are just why are Germans like this? What's going on in Germany? Um, you know, I don't think even Hitler. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't even think Hitler ever. You know, like. Maybe he did. Did he write down in a document, I am committing genocide against the Jews and then all of these other groups? Um, so, yeah, can you please lay out for our audience from your understanding, what is wrong with Germany? Why are they like this when it comes to Israel? Well, I think that at least 1,000 PhDs in psychology <laughs> are going to be written about this in the next 100 years. <laughs> Uh, you know, the academic uh, departments uh, in universities specializing in psychology are going to have their work cut out for them. So allow me my own non-psychologist, psychological theory. Um, what happened in Germany is that uh, there's been a combination of a justifiable collective guilt over the, the, the Holocaust. If I were German, I mean, I feel that guilt as a Greek because it's, it's wrong to put it all on the Germans. Mm -hmm. Because let's not forget that we, we had Greek Nazis, we had Croat Nazis, we had sub Nazis. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the Greek and the Croat Nazis were nastier to the Jews than the German Nazis were. There are reports of German Nazis uh, pulling the hair out at the cruelty towards Jews by the Croat Nazis. So it's not just Germans, right? But the, the Germans, understandably and justifiably, have a deep seated uh, sense of guilt over the Holocaust. At the same time, I don't believe that Germany ever properly de denazified. They claim they have de denazified. They have banned Nazi symbols. They have banned any party that, I mean, only the other day, the football national team banned the number 44 on the back of the vests because the, the fours look like very much like S's 
you know, so four four looks like SS. So they, they've done all that, but they never had a proper conversation about, you know, how was it that such a civilized, uh, cultured, well-educated population managed to, you know, be trapped in Nazism and to commit those uh, uh, monstrous crimes in the 1940s, before that, the 1930s and 40s. And they never had this conversation properly. The result of the collective guilt, the formal disavowal of everything that they had done in the 1930s and, 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 and 40s, with the fact that they never had a proper conversation about what led to Nazism and what was Nazism really. Right? It wasn't just some cult that took off and, you know, it, it wasn't some weed that they smoked and then they all went crazy for 10 years and then they recovered. Yeah, there, was, there were other things happening for a very long time there. Uh, so this combination, the incomplete denazification, the incomplete discussion and the collective guilt has led the vast majority of Germans to uh, swap their racist nationalism for ultra-Zionism. Ultra so the Germans today are uh, they are anti-nationalist. They are more pro-European than the French, than the Italians, because they want to lose themselves in Europe. They want to forget that they're German and lose themselves in Europe because they want to go away from this nationalism. But something has to take over and replace as a bond between them the nationalism that they are giving away, and that's Zionism. So in ultra-Zionism as well. So when Angela Merkel got up and said the raison d'etre, the rationale of Germany is the support and the security of the state of Israel, I think that's what she was doing. She was saying that, well, we cannot talk about German nationalism, not even patriotism. You know, progressives in Germany don't want to talk about patriotism because that reminds them of Hitler. Uh, but mm. it's easy to replace one nationalism for another. So in the same way, I love a very stupid, but I think quite comical uh, allegory. Uh, when Thatcher privatized uh, British electricity, you know, she sold it to a French nationalized company. So the, the, the wrong nation um, privatized the British electricity. Similarly, in the case of Germany, they are taking somebody else's white supremacist ideology, Zionism, <laughs> and they replace it for their own. At least that's, that's my theory. <laughs> Uh, by the way, that's a good one. Let, let me use your your your, your um, kindness to plug for Mera Twenty Five. Mera Twenty Five is my, our political party here in Greece, but it is also a political party in Germany. We are the only party that has a Greek party and a German party and an Italian party, and we are going to run in the election in June under Mera Twenty Five on a platform of turning around the German polity from Zionism towards supporting Palestinian rights and towards supporting a disentanglement of Germany from NATO. Wow. I actually think there, there's a huge base that would really, really support that uh, across Europe. They just don't have any representation anywhere. So I really look forward to seeing that. I was going to ask you, since you brought it up, um, that's a huge platform. I mean, that's like a huge part of the party's platform, but what else does it stand for? Oh, um, uh, firstly, we, 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 we do believe that uh, re-energizing the anti-war movement is essential, not just against war, but also against uh, the militarization of our e economies. Very recently, the president of the European Union Council suggested that Europe must try to re-industrialize through developing its own military industrial complex, which is just a remarkable. Uh, just remarkable. The second thing is, uh, uh, for the purposes of spreading dignity across Europe, uh, we believe that the European Central Bank should fund a basic income for all Europeans, uh, not through taxation, but directly through the European Central Bank. This is, sounds a bit like a technical issue, but let me put it this way. Um, in the last um, eight years, the European Central Bank has printed 11 trillion euros on behalf of the financiers. What we're saying is that it should print 5 trillion euros um, in order to support uh, the people who deserve uh, to live in some dignity in the richest continent in the world. And the third, that the, 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 the costs of the, of, the, of the climate crisis, of the climate emergency, of the climate catastrophe, must not be borne by the poor. These are the three planks with which we are running across Europe. 
Well, that sounds wonderful. And I look forward to seeing the results of that. And then since we're on the topic of your new political party, um, what do you think, I mean, is, are those are those points lacking in your in the former party you were involved in, in Greece, uh, Syriza, which I believe now has, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the leader of this party is a is a banker connected to the U.S. Is that correct? Can I enhance <laughs> your uh, apoplexy? By Please. That well, not only she, I mean, I don't mind people being connected to the U.S. I mean, it could be Noam Chomsky, right? I mean, if Noam Chomsky was living, yes, so, be very happy. Right. Now the problem is that this, this particular gentleman uh, and his CV has two words that should make. Well, I don't have any head to stand on end, but you do. Goldman Sachs. <laughs> he's he, he's yeah. an alumnus of Goldman Sachs. Uh, <laughs> need I add more? <laughs> no, but, yeah. I but, mean, a hotbed of leftist of leftist radicalization. But you see, <laughs> what what this shows is this: the the party that I joined in 2015, with which I ran, I was elected member of parliament, and then I became finance minister of that first government for six months or so. Uh, that party was a wonderful party. I mean, our, uh, if you look at the platform, everything I said to you before was part of that platform and more. It was connected to the movement. It was a party that grew up from the grassroots. Uh, initially, we were at 4% and we were shot up to 40% as a result of the inane handling of the terrible Greek and European financial crisis by the financiers and by the oligarchs. Uh, and we succeeded. It was one of those few very rare occasions when a grassroots party uh, gets elected and gets elected with, against the grain of the interests of the oligarchs, of the bankers, of the of NATO, off, off, off. We even had a platform for getting out of NATO, right? So it, 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 if you read the wow. text, and they were, they, were, they were part and parcel of the DNA of the people who supported us. The people who supported us were brilliant and pro-Palestinian and so on and so forth. And, but that is a very good case study in how the rot starts from the head and goes towards the bottom to the tail. Because once the prime minister, my dear friend and comrade at the time, uh, essentially surrendered during that clash we had with uh, the representatives, the Troika, as we call them, the representatives of the, of the worst of the financiers around the world. And, you know, the Berlin government and so on, he surrendered. And he surrendered right at the moment when, remember, it was a party that started 4%, we had gone up to 36%, 40%, and then six months later, during this clash with uh, the Troika, uh, we had a referendum and we we won 62%. So the people of Greece went, came, you know, sort of came to the party. They, 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 they embraced us. They supported us heroically, even though, the, you know, Think about it. They had shut down their AT ATMs. Our ATMs had been shut down by the powers that be in Frankfurt in order to uh, blackmail the Greek people not to support us. And they support us with 62%. On that night of the referendum, it was 5th of July, 2015. I would never I would go to my grave with that uh, date etched in my heart. Um, he surrendered. And I, he and I spent three hours in his office after midnight trying to convince him to dissuade him, I failed. Then I resigned. And then what happens is this. Just th This is a, a great lesson for me. The moment you surrender on the big things, then you surrender on the small things or the smaller things. Very soon after that, you know, the electricity system grid was split up and given away to oligarchs. Within six months, he was hugging Netanyahu and signing deals for oil drilling and gas drilling and pipelines connecting Israel to Cyprus to Greece. Thankfully, none of that happened, but the, the, the deal was there. And now Greece is a great supporter of the apartheid state, huh? which you can't blame it on the current government, which is a very right-wing government, but it was our government, the one that I just resigned from, that initiated it. And then from that moment onwards, everything, everything breaks down. And, you know, as I said, the rot sets in. And that's why some of us had to create another party. Yeah, it's a horrible cycle that just continues. And then I want to bring into it um, some ideas from your from your latest book on techno-feudalism, The End of Capitalism. 
Um, and that title, you know, it kind of gives the impression, at least to socialists like me, that, yay, it's the end of capitalism. Um, but don't get excited, guys, because actually what you're arguing is that it's morphed into something even worse, Good. where we're all in service to these, you know, feudal tech lords. Um, so can you explain to, to our audience what you mean by techno feudalism? And then and it's not because I want to make everything about Gaza. It's just I think that this actually plays into it a bit. Um, I'm just curious if after explaining the idea behind techno feudalism, um, if you could bring it back to Gaza in the sense that, you know, these tech overlords are in fact in charge of the social media mechanisms that we all are getting our information from right now. I and mean, we were watching a live stream genocide happen on their platforms where they have the capability of really curating and even censoring uh, content on Israel's behalf. Yes. Well, to begin with, I'll, I'll take as my cue what you said that techno-feudalism is not something to celebrate. It's something worse than capitalism, much worse than capitalism. That's, that, that's not entirely my idea. Um, I mentioned Rosa Luxemburg before, but I will do it again. Was it not Rosa who said from her cell, from pr her prison cell, that the world is facing a dilemma, socialism or barbarism, not capitalism? If we don't succeed in creating socialism out of capitalism, we're going to end up with barbarism. Well, that's where we are. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear the rest, you can access it by becoming a Breakthrough News member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news.